Okay, so I'm uh, very pleased to introduce uh, Baron Dr. Maurice Glassman, who is a life peer in the British House of Lords on behalf of the Labour Party. He's a lecturer on political thought and has expertise in community organizing also. And uh, in 2009, he founded the Blue Labour Movement, which advocates a community-based democratic socialism. He's a I think is an important public intellectual in Britain, and we are very, very pleased to have him with us. Welcome. Okay. Does this work? Great. So, Buketov, um, it's it's really lovely to to be here uh, with you. It's when I was when I was um, I was thinking about it. How long is it since I've spent a night in Jerusalem? And it's something like 40 years so uh, 40 years ago and it's a strange story so I went to a Jewish comprehensive school in London and uh, there was a strategy for dealing with um, children with behavioral difficulties right so there were and so children from the West Indies they used to send them back to the West Indies to link up with their cultural roots and from Bangladesh, they sent them to Bangladesh. But where did you send, it was an interesting question, where did you send Jews? Where do they go back to when they get into trouble? So so they sent me to, um, they sent me to Israel, which, you know, it was a very interesting choice. And they sent me to a, uh, to a religious girls boarding school in Yavna. So it's taken this 40 years to return. I'm still thinking about all of that. Um, yeah, it was a Karen Biyavna. There was a kibbutz, there was a yeshiva, and, um, and there was a girls' boarding school for essentially Yemenite uh, girls. So this is the story of, uh, of my life. It is, it's, lovely. it's lovely and extremely moving, actually, to be back. And thank you to Elon, and it's very good to see to see you all and I thought I'd be so first of all I think I should say and it's important that in turn I'm sort of made that move from academia into politics so I am a populist I think that's important to put it out um, I'm a very happy populist um, but it seems that it makes the people around me unhappy so I noticed that that is the um, that that is the that that is the case. So I thought I'd, uh, as they say these days in left-wing circles, I thought I'd self-identify um, in that way. And the first thing I wanted to do is really just when I was thinking about this was to share. So a few months ago, a couple of months ago, it was on um, Pesach to be exact. I was in Baghdad. I spent um, five days in Baghdad, and I sat by the Tigris. And I took two packets of matzah with me, which I thought would last last for the trip. And I realized, and I was told several times, that I was the only Jew in Baghdad on, on Pesach. And it, it was a kind of a very shocking thing to be there when 100 years before, it was at least one third a Jewish. So I sat by the river. I. And I looked around me, and and there was a shocking familiarity to 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 where I sat, and I was joined for a coffee by members of the Communist Party who heard I was coming, and they wanted to have a chat, and they told me some interesting things that I wanted to share with you, that I just didn't know. The first was that they said that half the members of the Iraqi Communist Party were Jews before before the Jews um, before the Jews left and the other half was Shia so this was all news to me and there were sons there who remembered their parents talking about their Jewish comrades with with tremendous affection the second thing is that they really liked the matzah but they had no cultural memory of what it was so the memory had gone of what Pesach was it must have been a quite amazing thing in Baghdad. I obviously felt very bad because they were eating all my matzah. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, I only had two boxes and 
there was a long journey ahead, but it's a bit difficult to stop eating it. They, oh, this is nice. And they used to tell me that the communists in Baghdad used to organize in the slum areas. So they used to go to what's now called uh, Sadra City, I think it used to be Saddam City, that just used to be a Shia slum area um, around Baghdad. And that the message, the, the message of communism had a huge resonance among the Shia poor. So, you know, they, they told me that all the Jews had left, that Saddam Hussein had then killed all the leaders, most of its members, but they were still there. And when I told them I was coming to Israel to give a talk, they asked me particularly to, to bring a message to you. Um, so they said that if there's any children of Iraqi communists, they wanted to tell them that they'd kept the faith, that they were still organizing, and to please get in touch. So I'm passing on that message. And if what they told me was true, then at least one of you must be the descendant of an Iraqi communist Jew. Is there anybody here who's... Is... No? No, no. Do you know any? Do you know any of the children? Any? Any? Nothing? So what they told me, obviously. Mm. So that cast some suspicion, because they were kind of, they said that there were three types of Jews in Baghdad. There were doctors, lots of doctors, business or communists. That was their basic try, you know, and they, they, were, they, they were kind of strangely sure that, that the Iraqi Jews still were communists in Israel. I, I didn't say anything, I just moved on. Now, they also told me that the Communist Party had gone into alliance with Muqtada al-Sadra in the elections that were coming up. Um, he's sort of, I think, best described as the godfather of the Shia Mahdi army. Um, and, and they also told me that they were going to win. And I was skeptical about that, but they did win. They came, they came first and they won 56 seats in the Iraqi parliament. And the program that they were running on was, was essentially a national, what they described as quite nostalgic words, a national unity program. And they told me that the Communist Party was for many years the only party in Iraq that was not built around religious or ethnic affiliation. It wasn't confessional, that practiced equality between men and women and opposed the British mandate, which brought back memories. And, or rather, they were running on a nationalist platform, which was very strongly anti-American and anti-Iran. Um, they really opposed Kurdish separatism and I'm very involved with Kurds in both Britain and Syria and Turkey, and that they wish to build a national political program uh, between all communities. And what they were really running on was a, was a populist anti-corruption platform, polarizing against the privileges of what they call over there the green zone. That there's this, there's this world that looks quite a lot like this, where people seem to be richer and wealthier and they get water and they get heat and they get jobs and then there's outside the green zone it's a completely um, different story so they were running a very populist polarizing against the green zone and the political and economic bosses who seem to be living better than them ayatollah sistani who's basically the chief rabbi in najaf set the tone and he issued a fatwa on the day I was there which only was made up of one sentence which it was better to vote for an honest Christian than a corrupt Muslim so that was the general tone that I'm sharing with you and they'd built a coalition between secular it wasn't just the communists who were in this coalition it was the social democrats who let's face it all three of them were, were in there um, the Greens, who, who, who were part of their, and the Iraqi Socialist Party, were part of this coalition called Cyrun. Um, and, and they had a vision of democracy and a moral economy that was based on some kind of idea of a shared ethical relationship between people in society that was linked to ancient ideas of citizenship, of participative self-government, and of local assemblies. So, uh, Danny, it's important, you know, your thing with the Civic Republicans and the Polanyi. So in the Brexit campaign, all of your lot voted to remain in the EU. 
and our lot voted to leave the EU. I remember Quinton Skinner, who's quite a serious figure, the day after the vote, he said to me, there's much to learn, he said, from the Italian republics, because only if you had an education could you vote. So I'm just saying that that was a... Um, yeah, civic yeah, civic republicanism. I'm just... Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm just, I'm just raising, I'm raising the issue of, of what that distinction actually is about. But what they really wanted to talk about in Baghdad was whether there was an economic model knocking about in what they called the West or the Left that could be adapted to the Iraqi context. So they said that the Shia, or as they refer to them, the Shia masses, <coughs> had a strong sense of a moral economy, a very strong suspicion of capitalism, but they combined it with an equal dislike of a centralized state. The experience of Baathism and Saddam Hussein had made a big impression. They'd read a few things that I'd written about blue labor, Catholic social thought, and I think I'd need to, to, to explain. So Catholic social thought, I, I turned to because there was so little Jewish social thought or Jewish political economy. I, I, um, we can talk about that. And about this idea of the common good, which is central to this negotiated settlement between estranged interests. And they wanted to know if there, could, if there was anything that could help them develop a secular Shia position. So this was all quite new to me. So I asked what form that the Shia ethics took. What was the particular form um, of, of this Shia idea of a moral economy? And they told me the story that when the wicked Yazid, who was the caliph, um, Umayyad caliph of that time, um, surrounded the completely fantastic Imam Hussein, of which obviously Hussein is a direct descendant, um, at the Battle of Karbala, um, with the Euphrates visible, he and his family and his followers were denied water, and most of them died of thirst. So this is the foundational story of the Shia, is that this great ethical guy and his family and his followers were denied water and, and died. And there is a particular martyrdom of Abbas which is all about him going to get water for the crying children at the expense of his life. And they live that every year in what's called the Arba'in, which is a whole series of things um, around Ashura. So for them, water was not considered a commodity or something that should be hoarded. It was a necessity and a good that should not be privately controlled or sold or used for political reasons to manipulate people to your will. It should be shared. Water was sacred. So the campaign slogan that they ran on was sharing the water. That was it. That was their badges. That was their that was their their posters. So for the Shia, sharing water was a primary religious commandment. And I thought that that sounded like a very promising start. So I said, what about oil? And they thought pretty much the same about oil as about water. It seemed it was a gift from God and should be shared. It was a shared asset of all Iraqis, not something owned by the oil companies or by the state. And when I dug deeper, it turned out that being greedy and loving yourself was not popular. More emphasis was given to what others thought of you than of how you defined yourself. And that begin, began to sound like a welcome change from the identity politics of the Labour Party, where any doubting of someone's self-definition is considered to be an aggression. So honest Labour was respected, but their problem remained that while Shia politics had developed a good line in hypocrisy, so it's interesting, the leaders have to always pretend to be unhappy and suffering and miserable. Um, they didn't have a political economy that was built around that sense of a moral economy. Um, although it was deeply held, it was barely articulated. So it had no institutional form. So the reason I share this with you is that moral outrage at capitalism is universal. It's held most deeply by poor communities that confront this particular package that we've developed for them, um, which is economic liberalism on the one side, also known as capitalism, and then there's political liberalism, which is a rights-based administrative state, a legal order um, state. 
And that together is globalization. So in order to buy into globalization, you've got to accept economic and political liberalism and any resistance to that is automatically considered to be populist. So I think that's where we are. Populism is just that. A disagreement with the IMF and the World Bank is already bad person, bad character. So any form of democracy that seeks to assert institutional constraints on the growing of a person's property and wealth is populist. And I noticed that commentators and academics were scrabbling around to find a word to describe this communist Mahdi army alliance. They tried charismatic, that lasted for a day or two. Then they moved to controversial on Maverick, but that didn't really stick. So you know where it's going. They all settled on populist. And that's what you get for sharing the water. I just want to raise this issue. That whole election, as far as I could see, was about this concept of sharing the water, but that in itself was considered fundamentally morally wrong and the result of obviously bad parenting and, and a generally um, shabby culture. So in a nutshell, populism is anything that defies the teleology of liberal modernity. This is what's at stake here. There is a vision of liberal modernity, technology, borderless worlds, free movement. Anything that defies that in the name of democracy is at the moment automatically classified as populist. Can you I'll try. I, I was improvising, so I'll now go back to the written text. Okay, so I'll go back to the bit of the written text that that's what you get for sharing the water. Okay populism. So populism is anything that defies the teleology of liberal modernity, the domination of technology, and a borderless procedural legal system, and the free movement of capital, people, money, and things. So I can send you a copy of the paper. It's, it's good. <laughs> so it's the ultimate tragedy and farce of the contemporary left for which I'm part, that we can't articulate a moral critique of capitalism on the basis of democracy because that would expose our lack of popularity and support in the hearts and minds of the people. It would reveal our, our lack of trust in them and our lack of belief in their, in their conception of the sacred. So that's why I raised the issue of the water. What populism is really about is preserving a sense of something sacred something covenantal and what i've certainly noticed with my tribe liberal progressive jews is that we don't like other people having a concept of the sacred that's really bad we can but they can't and that came out very strongly in the brexit campaign so the idea of a parliament and the common law and an inheritance of an institutional system that was kind of considered sort of fascist in a way. So a covenantal politics is deeply part of what populism is, a redemption of an older promise, and that's considered um, very, very bad. So um, there's, a, there's a real lack of understanding or respect for a sense of moral relationships between people that have been threatened by capitalism, humiliated by liberalism, and now can find no refuge in left politics. So the fundal explanation I've got and we'll be developing here is, is that right-wing authoritarian populism, or whatever you want to call it, is fund the fundamental cause is the lack of a generous, inclusive left ideology. Um, and, and that's obviously the task before us. So the Communist Party in Iraq is deeply secular. And uh, the conversation with them is something I'm sure that you'll understand. They pointed out to me throughout the conversation that they didn't believe any of this stuff about Imam Hussein and the water and Karbala. They were just explaining to me that these were something that were believed by the people and the people were looking to them for hope and leadership in building a secular polity that respected those values. So just briefly, in order to explain how I understand this coalition and particularly Muqtada al-Sadra, just imagine for a moment, because many of you are academics, so we do this sort of thing, we imagine for a moment. I'm not suggesting that you do it for long. Um, just imagine a fully militarized shas party. 
right, with with local militias that control the streets of Petah Tikva and other places, right? So a fully fully mobilised militia shas party party that was in alliance with the communists and left slate, and that they'd just won an election, and were calling and were forming the next Israeli government. They were in that process of conversations. And they were calling for full Palestinian participation in the governance of the economy and society, and above all, for democratic accountability at all levels of society. At their vanguard were enraged Iraqi Jews who were going to rule in a righteous spirit of justice. The polarization would be against the liberal Ashkenazi left. In this scenario, the orthodox rabbinate is a force for moderation. So, I try. I'm just sharing with you. That's that's the that's roughly how I I would translate that scene. So I then travelled from Baghdad to 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 visit the Kurds in northern Syria. I don't know how much this has been covered here. A place called Rojava. Um, its its technical name is the Democratic Confederation of Northern Syria, and the same question was posed there. I spent a week there. So ISIS was defeated. Or Daesh was defeated. Uh, by the by, a Kurdish-led coalition, um, not on the basis of religion or nationalism, but in the name of a participatory democracy with full women's equality, they have built something eerily reminiscent of the early kibbutz system, a kind of local commune form of self-government that they call democratic confederalism, and they wish to build a democratic economy. They told me that did not fall back into a centralized state or a free market. And that is the thing they really wanted to talk about. But it's also true that Turkey was bombing them out of their homes and was not letting them back, which was also, as you can imagine, a topic of conversation. Now, this lot who beat ISIS in the name of democracy, they're so populist that they're officially designated as terrorists. Right. So that's where we are in the in the in the world. So I found it curiously comforting that I was asked to write a, a very similar paper in response to the same question to be given both in Jerusalem and in Najaf, where I will be going in July. I found it a lot less comforting that the politics of Baghdad are more promising than those of Jerusalem. And the next part of this paper is a reflection on the meaning of populism in academic discourse. As I mentioned, as a supporter of Brexit, I have become very familiar with the snobbery and assumptions of the progressive left. And I think it is this that needs to be challenged before a constructive alternative can be made meaningful. So when I studied history at university, just uh, it's very nice to meet you, by the way, I was very interested in, in your area. I was taught that populism was a good thing. That it was a while ago. That populism was, was this very good thing that emerged in the United States in the 1890s as a democratic coalition between southern farmers and eastern workers um, that had some understanding of class and capital and that reached out to also to small black farmers for support. Um, the way I was taught in the in the late 70s and early 80s was, was it was as close as America came to a Labour Party that could challenge the domination of finance capital in the organisation of the economy and bring some security and stability to both farmers and workers. And in many ways, it was the last gasp of a vanquished tradition, of which I am, of course, part, which saw democracy as a means of shaping the economy in the interests of the small rather than the big. That's the key thing about populism, is it tries to constrain the emergence of large and to keep the small farm the dignity of work. These were the, these were the concepts. Now, Roosevelt's New Deal was by definition a big deal. Um, and was based on big projects led by Keynesian big brains. But populism spoke about the homestead and the small farmer, about families and the dignity of work. And this is an important thing about populism is nostalgia. And nostos, the Greek nostos, means longing for home. It's a desire for some notion of, of home. And if you look at liberalism, if you look at capitalism, statism, liberalism and globalization, it's an endless disruption of settlement, an endless disruption of home and a move towards huge corporations and large systems. 
So pop populism um, was the last gasp, if you like, in America in this analysis of trying to preserve some notion of attachment to land, to place, um, to home, and to, to constrain the domination um, of finance capital. Um, on the left, the most interesting thinker, I think, is Antonio Gramsci, who, who wrote very well on this, and the need to build a popular coalition of disparate forces. He called the period in which, to quote him, the old is dead, but the new cannot be born. He called it an interregnum, a time in between times. Um, in which, to quote Gramsci, there is a fraternization of impossibles and all manner of morbid symptoms pertain. So a time just like our own. So I think we're living in an interregnum. The old is dead, the new cannot be born, there's all manner of weird, you know, big arguments in England now are about gendered toilets, right? And passports, you know, believe me, people are not talking about this around the kitchen table. Um, so we're in that strange time at the moment. And for Gramsci, fascism was not populist, but elitist, a co-option of the national popular, as he called it, by the already powerful due to the inability of the left to, quote, feel the elementary passions of the people to share them and to shape them. So I'm I'm, I'm sharing that as a definition of the time we're in. So the turn against populism um, in academic analysis came with the retreat to psychology as a means of explaining the rise of fascism and the downgrading of class, culture, and power as important explanatory variables in the analysis of political outcomes. The roots of this kind of psychological research I think can be traced back to an influential book published in 1950 called The Authoritarian Personality, written by a group of academics at the University of California in, in Berkeley, and based on their study of prejudice and anti-democratic tendencies among Americans. I found out writing this paper that it was sponsored by the American Jewish Committee, as usual, and it was based on Adorno's work in Frankfurt, undertaken with Max Horkheimer around the you know, critical school, um, which was based on this authoritarian personality and what he called the F scale, or the pre-fascist personality scale, which formed the methodology of the study and the survey questionnaire that they developed. So the F scale listed a set of psychological dimensions that could be measured in individuals. For example, conformity to traditional social norms, upholding the values of the middle class, submission to conventional norms and values and towards in-group authority figures, punishing and condemning individuals who don't hold those conventional values, a rejection of inwardness, the subjective, the imaginative, and of self-criticism. And they developed a psychometric test to identify a personality type. So basically, in this personality type, um, if you were right-wing, you were mentally ill, and psychologically unstable. And if you were left-wing, you were sane. So that's roughly um, the, the analysis that, that, that they developed. It's extraordinary that it developed so deep and so far. Um, so any agreement to any, any conservatism, which I'll get to, any cultural conservatism was, was immediately seen as a pathological disorder in some way in this, um, in this analysis. Um, Christopher Lash is a very big theorist for me, was right on to this right from the late 60s and all his stuff, he really understood it and a very good piece in, in Tikkun, in, in the magazine Tikkun in the first issue in 1987 really goes through this I think very well. So this had consequences, Adorno's involvement led to this interest in, in authoritarian populism and he, Stuart Hall, who was a very important um, sociologist, left sociologist in Britain, used it to explain the, the rise of fascism, um, rather, the rise of Thatcherism, which he saw, strange thing he said about Thatcherism, it's fascism, but she's kept all the institutions. That's, that's odd, 
you know, so he didn't draw the conclusion that it wasn't fascist. He just had to find a way of explaining that. Present work, Milton Rakiat has extended the work to a psychological understanding. This is a classic of the genre of open versus closed forms of minds. As if we can be anything other than open and closed. As if this idea, you know, this idea that we're all open and they're all closed. But this is all respectable academic work. Uh, Bob Altemeyer signified that uh, used Adorno's F scale in response to criticisms and created a new right wing authoritarian psychometric test. Uh, and, and then it's been, as you know, very well used in looking at libertarian and authoritarian values. So what it does is it constructs a binary personality type using cognitive psychology um, in order to develop a reductive and limited view of human subjectivity. Using this method to explain complex sociological processes results ultimately in a mechanistic, dualistic and crude, invariably polarizing understanding of social relationships and political identification. And this is where we are now. So the use of this type of psychological work or, and political work um, to understand authorities, authoritarian populism, it reduces Brexit, Trump, Netanyahu voters to an undifferentiated group of undesirables or inadequates. Their vote is presented as a product of their dysfunctional psychological reaction to social change. So there's this uncritical view of change, that this is a very good thing. Being open to change is a very good thing. And anybody who rejects that, bad, very bad thing. So each negative adjective attached to them has a corollary of a positive one for progressive voters. I don't know if this joke makes sense here. I always say in political speeches, it's the last thing you want to hear when you go to the doctor. It's progressive. Right, I, don't know, I don't know if that is it, just some way of breaking the news that things can go wrong. You know, that, being, that, there's, that there is some tragedy in human life. So when I hear the word progressive, I say that's, that's very bad. So what are, these, what, what are these closed and open things for progressive and, and non-progressive uh, voters? So the first is authoritarian versus liberal. That's, that's one binary. Closed versus open is another one of the, and uneducated versus educated. That's very important. The more degrees you have, the better person um, you are. And, and then it reached a climax, I think, in the only line of poetry from Hillary Clinton's campaign. And I don't know how this translates, but she called Trump voters a basket of deplorables. Now, it's a really interesting one because it's a kind of developed poetic metaphor. So you could talk about a basket of currencies. You can talk about a flock of seagulls. You know, there's various, you know, a case of knives. Um, but this is a basket of deplorables. So there's a range of deplorables, I imagine, in the basket, you know. And is it... So basically, she polarised against her own voters and they wonder why she lost. This has to be explained psychologically, why she lost. How about insulting your electorate is a very good place to start. So a, a study by K, I've got to live with this, so apologies for, for giving you examples from Britain now, but I had to live with this with the Brexit vote. The Brexit vote was not a good thing, and it has to be explained in certain categories. So. A study by Cambridge University a few weeks ago claimed that Leave voters had a tendency, this is a very important word for progressives, that they had a tendency to be less creative. Creative is a very good thing, by the way. We, we should be always creative. Um, I think it's, an, it's, a, it's a concept used for accounting. Basically, creative accounting means... <laughs> means means cheating and lying and exaggerating but we don't see it like that we think creative very good very good children creative good very good um so so leave voters are less creative and they're markedly worse at quote coping with change than remain voters if you actually looked at how remain voters have responded to the vote you wouldn't think that they were very good at dealing with change but anyway we'll return to that they lack 
cognitive flexibility, very important concept, and so are more likely to support authoritarian ideologies. They have tight, impermeable boundaries, these approaches from this report, and they tend to gravitate towards a more ethnocentric, nationalist, and socially conservative mindset. A spokesperson said, by connecting the realm of cognition to that of ideology, we find the flexibility of thought may have far-reaching consequences for social and political attitudes. Exactly the same. It's in the paper. Stuff came out in a big study of Essex, from Essex University, which was called The Consequences of Authoritarian Populism in Britain. And it concluded that over half the people in Britain have an authoritarian personality type. So there you go. These individuals tended to have bad thoughts about immigration, human rights, and most importantly, the EU. This was backed up by a YouGov poll. The 2017 British Social Attitudes report said that older people tended to be more authoritarian and socially conservative. And it's got, as usual, all the lists of the open closed things. Chatham House is the same. now. What I'm trying to say is, is, is that this whole concept of populism and authoritarian populism as viewed through the prism of cognitive psychology um, is, is deeply political, deeply flawed and deeply biased and is anything but what the consequences of authoritarian populism in Britain said, that they described it as politically neutral, that this is just a politically neutral attempt to understand social um, problems. So a negative framing of Leave and Trump voters reproduces, in my view, the long-standing and uncritical class condescension of the liberal intelligentsia. And it also avoids addressing the ways in which our own interests in increasing global mobility, support for high levels of immigration, and a tendency to self-exemption from the ties of nation and place and the ways that they have contributed to the growth of populism. The same kind of analysis can be found in two books recently published, Yasha Munk's The People vs. Democracy, Why Our Freedom is in Danger and How to Save It, published by Harvard, and William Galston's Anti-Pluralism, The Populist Threat to Liberal Democracy, published by Yale, and they tell very much the same story. Open versus closed, educated versus uneducated, the obvious superiority of liberal democracy over any other form of societal organization, without any acknowledgement that the present system not only favours those with capital over those without, or those with qualifications over those without, it also prefers those who wish to leave to those who wish to stay. That's a, that's a very big part of it. They reproduce the lash pathology on every page. The conclusion is that the working class vote against their own interests, obviously, because they are either bad people or stupid people, but on the whole, they're both. So that's the, that's the dealing of the academic work on populism. So my argument to you to, is that in, a, in an interregnum such as we are in, democratic politics is an argument over sanity. That's what it is. You must, that's what's up for grabs, is the definition of what is and is not reasonable to believe. During periods when the old is dying and the new is yet to be born, there is always a period of uncertainty and menace, when the previous certainties characteristic of a consensus no longer hold, and previously marginal voices are heard far more forcefully and make more sense. Such periods redefine the possibilities of politics for a generation, shifting the meaning of common sense and the definition of orthodoxy, extremism and moderation. The problem is, is the previous consensus, as I've tried to display in the analysis of populism, can no, longer, can no longer predict or explain reality. There is a real predictive problem in the dominant model. And the democratic argument is over what will replace it. So I think this is what is at stake in our workshop over the next couple of days, summarized as the inability of the left to explain or act in the world and its reluctance to engage with building relationships with others who do not agree with us and who dispute our values. That's where we are, and that's what I hope we talk about. But it is also about the durability and persistence of values that are now defined as conservative. 
the desire to have a home and some security of habitation, to have long-term loving relationships as a goal of human life, of an affection for inherited institutions and conventions as a necessary aspect of democratic association, of a sense, which I don't really need to explain here, of place. This is a tradition that goes back to Aristotle and finds its strongest contemporary proponent in Alistair MacIntyre and which underpins the work of Karl Polanyi as well as Catholic social thought. And it views people as social beings with a tendency to settlement and attachment who find their meaning through love and through work. And the endless pressure of the commodification of human beings and nature the velocity of dispossession and displacement generated by the progressive consensus which combines capitalism, statism and liberal, liberalism wrapped up in globalization is worth resisting in the name of democracy and that the ideal, the ideal of a home in the world that can be negotiated, negotiated with others comes into centre stage. And here I do think that Ocalan and the Kurds are ahead of us in building an institutional alternative. Saul Alinsky, who's part of this story um, and sort of where I come out of, listed as one of his rules that a constructive alternative was the price of a successful politics. That, that's what you, that was the work. Was you always, somebody would always turn around ultimately and say, well, what would you do? And if you've got nothing to say about what you'd do, beyond more women in the boardroom. That's one that I hear a lot. You know, there's no structural change to, to capitalism, no reform of the state, then the politics won't grow. So it's worth concluding on what the economic alternative would be. So I would start out with the understanding that capital has a tendency to centralize and concentrate that is the equal of the state. In Britain, the entire inherited wealth of the country is concentrated in six banks and four pension funds, and we nearly lost it all overnight on October the 8th, 2008. That was the kind of trauma <laughs> that hung over the entire <coughs> nation and hasn't really gone away. So an entire civic ecology of local banking institutions were demutualized and privatized in the birth pangs of the liberal globalization era and they no longer exist. I don't know if that's true here. When I arrived at the airport, there was still Bank Leomi and there was still, there's still, are they still functioning autonomous institutions or have they been corporatized and taken over? They've been privatized, exactly. So the names, in England, the, the humiliation is the names remain, but the ownership is completely, is completely different. I don't know. Oh, they're still bankrolling Labour. Well, that needs, you know, Labour needs some support. That's interesting. If, if Labour's real significant social support is actually capital, that's actually an interesting sociological observation of some kind. So they haven't got people, but they have got money. That's quite interesting. So the first act of an alternative political economy that understood the necessity of a home and place, that understood the tendency of capital to centralize, would be the endowment of regional banks that could not lend outside the area that they are in and which could constrain the pressure to maximize returns, which led directly to the financial crash and the bailout. So an embedded notion um, of capital in the places that people live and work. So the financial crash was the result of a failure of many things, but one of them was also corporate governance. A comparative analysis of corporate restructuring, restructuring strategy in Germany on the one side and Britain and the United States tells the story clearly. In Germany, through the representation of workers on boards, each stakeholder interest, capital, labor and management had access to the same information about the state of the firm and the sector and could negotiate a common response. So the governance and strategy of the firm itself became a matter of negotiation as the workforce and their representatives gained a knowledge of economic performance and a practical role in the management of the economy. The workforce has interests in the flourishing of firms and an internal expertise in the work of the firms and the risks that they carry in terms of losing their livelihood if the company fails. So the sacrifices asked as workers was balanced by their participation in the process of production as an institutional partner. 
So a common good model or a Polanyi model of corporate governance ensures that the workforce have the information and institutional power to negotiate enterprise and sectoral strategies of renewal. So I would roughly say a third of the seats on the board for capital, a third of the seats for the workforce, and then a third of the seats for the area that it's in. So that you embed, um, you embed the firm in, in, the, in that place. I don't know what the situation is here, so I'll go lightly, but in England there's been a massive preference for university education over vocational education that's been absolutely... So the knowledge economy, I, I know, I was, I was in Israel a while ago and it was a nightmare, the startup nation. I remember that all Jewish history is now summarised in being a startup nation. That's that can't be right. Um, but there was, and then that went to the knowledge economy, and then, of course, the creative, the creative economy. That's 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 always the word that that, that is used when the working class is going to be really humiliated. Um, so there's been a massive. Um, investment in university and in transferable skills and not in vocational and specific skills and then the lack of having specific skills led to the necessity of immigration so the working class were told simultaneously we're not going to train you to do anything because that's old-fashioned and that's not part of the creative economy and at the same time you've got to have mass immigration because you're so useless and you can't do the work. So that was a, a big part uh, of what happened with the Brexit vote. In terms of globalised liberal teleology, it was assumed that there would be a decline in manual jobs and an increase in transferable skills. Gordon Brown, who was Prime Minister, predicted in a 2006 speech that there would only be 600,000 low-skilled jobs in Britain by 2020. Um, in fact, the figure is 3 million. And so there was a complete misreading of reality. They just thought that manual jobs would no longer exist. But the, the figures are there and in the paper. In 1984, there were 70 universities in Britain. Now there's 170. 14% used to go to university then. Now it's 48%. The budget then was 7 billion. Today it's 33 billion. And there's been exactly an equal collapse of investment in vocational education. So. That's the class nature um, of the progressive liberal teleology. So you might say that the human desire to earn and belong has not been part of this approach. And the result is that what we have is a polarised labour market and a polarised politics. So the alternative that I'm presenting to you here is that we should understand people as embedded and embodied and not simply as either rational choosers or as closed-minded authoritarian personality types. What is required is an economy that is embedded and embodied through banking and vocational institutions that constrain capital, but also we need to think very seriously about the renewal of essentially an old-style kibbutz system participative local assemblies. You know, that's a very important part of the work. And it is worth mentioning in conclusion that capital in its essential form is promiscuous. That's what it is. It seeks the highest rate of return at the fastest possible speed. Once the returns begin to slow, it seeks new partners that can de deliver higher returns quicker. When human beings are the commodities, this leads to an inhumane system that disrupts relationships and durable patterns of life that offend against people's sense of the sacred Extreme cases would be prostitution and body part sales. It also exploits and degrades nature in ways that deplete a necessary inheritance for future generations. In other words, it becomes a form of nihilistic plunder in which the incentive structures are towards vice and a working around of the rules and regulations which are seen as an external imposition. So that's why there needs to be and internal goods, internal power within the firm and within the structures of capitalism. Karl Polanyi's argument developed in the Great Transformation that the economy, the satisfaction of human needs and wants through skillful and complex work, is threatened by the commodification of labour, land and money, the factor markets, is an important one. 
So the economy requires social institutions that disseminate skills, distribute knowledge, and preserve the status of the person as something other than a commodity. Societal institutions of non-pecuniary form renew the cultural resources or constituents of society from depletion and exhaustion by defying the claims of capital and educating the person towards a notion of internal goods as well as external value. So my conclusions are paradoxical. In order to build a radical democratic politics, we must become more conservative. In order to redeem citizenship, we must build alliances with faith, that modernization is based on the renewal of tradition, and perhaps most importantly, that populism is the best hope of democracy. Okay, thank you.